So, welcome everybody. Today's speaker is Philip Rindler from Warwick University, and he will talk about space-time integral currents of bounded variations. Please take it away. Okay, right. So, uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to um, give this talk in a geometric analysis seminar. And um, yeah, well, the title is on the first slide. It's about um, space-time integral currents of bounded variation. And um, so it's fairly recent uh, that the preprint appeared, but I should say that this is, if you want, part of a bigger project, which I've been uh, working on for some time, namely uh, about understanding uh, dislocations and plasticity. Um, and so, in fact, I will start this talk by giving you a bit of a, a crash course in this, in this fascinating field. So I'll just give you a few outline uh, points uh, that hopefully are um, um, give you an idea of why I, I wanted to go in this direction. Okay, so what is plasticity? Well, plasticity is the, um, the theory of permanent deformations of uh, materials. So for instance, you see this little, um, little block here, which has this strut coming out and then the strut gets bent. And, and the point is that it gets permanently deformed by a deformation. And then if you take your hands off, it will, it will stay in that, uh, in that deformed shape. Um, and um, so if you zoom in on the microscopic picture and you want to understand what happens on the level of the crystal lattice, of course, let's say this is a metal, so it might have a, a nice crystal structure. So a schematic could be, could be this one. So you start with a, a very nice lattice here. So on the left, let's say it's perfect for the time being, this will change very soon. And um, let's say you want to shift the top bits uh, to the right. So you see, I've, I've just taken the first two rows of atoms and shifted them to the right. And then of course I've broken these bonds and uh, sorry, broken, I've broken these bonds here and, and kind of reconnected them in a different way. And so then the whole material shears to the right, as you can see. Now, unfortunately, if, this naive picture were true. So if you would have to break all the bonds along one plane in the crystal lattice, you could not bend a spoon. I mean, unless you're Uri Geller, I guess, who can do it with his mind, but not if you are uh, actually using your muscles to it because you would be too weak and the spoon would be too strong. So in fact, this is not what happens in real materials. What happens in real materials is, is the following. So the crystal is not actually perfect as I drew here. It actually looks more like this. So it has these faults in it. You can see this, uh, this lattice plane here just ends at this atom and then you have this fault. And for atomistic reasons, um, this doesn't just happen in one point but actually happens on a whole line along the, um, along the, uh, in, into the, the slide here. And this is called an edge dislocation. And there's also another type of dislocation, screw dislocations, but they're harder to visualize. So I'm just gonna stick with edge dislocations here because for, the, for this talk, at least it doesn't matter. And so what actually happens in a material as it is plastically deformed is you're breaking just this row of bonds here, and then you reconnect all of them in this way, you see. And then what happens is the dislocation has wandered uh, to the right. Yeah, So it's moved one lattice position to the right. And if you do this again and again and again, then you see that somehow schematically um, this, this um, specimen gets deformed more and more. And uh, this would be a simple shear here by, by moving the dislocation along. Yeah? And this is actually what happens in real materials. There's a lot of those dislocations in each little uh, part of your material. And they, if, you, if you bend your spoon, they move about and, and affect this. this um, plastic deformation. Right, so I mentioned already that dislocation, that these uh, defects that are on lines are called dislocations. They're also point defects, but they not so, they're not important for this talk. And I mean, one way to, to understand what a dislocation is, you can kind of take, give yourself um, a circuit here, and then you can count how many atoms you, you, how many bonds you cross. So let's say here, I've got one, two, three, but then when I go in the other direction, I only have two. So there's a mismatch, right? Because there's this lattice plane that ends. And that's, if you want the definition of a dislocation, that there's this error that you can detect by going around such a circuit. Now, um, of course, uh, this 
so far, I've just tell, told you a little bit about this, the mechanics, if you want, or the kinematics of this problem. But of course, people have been trying to study this mathematically for a long time. And um, in fact, with increasing amount of sophistication and, and quite common nowadays is to model these dislocations as one dimensional integral currents. And I will I have a slide here while we call these notions briefly so that even if Fedora is not on your bedside table, then you might st you can still uh, um, hopefully get an intuition of what I'm talking about. But uh, before I do that, let me already mention that um, these are really uh, one-dimensional objects. Yeah, so they are lines, effectively loops later in a three-dimensional medium, and so that means they have co-dimension two, right? So the dimension of the ambient space minus the dimension of the object, and that's two. And people who know a bit of geometric analysis know that co-dimension one is usually a very nice and partly special case. But if you go to a higher co-dimension, things become a bit more complicated. But you see here, we really do need to look at the higher co-dimension case out of necessity, really, because we are interested in one-dimensional objects in um, three-dimensional media. And um, so I mentioned this before. So for atomistic reasons, it cannot really happen that these loops end in the material, in the crystal. So if they were, if they ended there, it would be energetically favorable for this, for the line to kind of grow all the way to the boundary of, of your specimen. So uh, mathematically, you can express this saying that they are boundaryless. Now, technically, they're only boundaryless within your domain omega. However, because of effectively technical reasons, I want them to be globally uh, boundaryless. So you can think of this as just putting virtual lines on the boundary of the material to kind of close the loops which, which ended at the boundary. So this is really, <clears throat> really a technical point here. And um, <clears throat> before I go on, I just wanted to show a list. I mean, there's a huge amount of people who have used this um, theory in one form or another. And um, I mean, I'm, I've only tried to give a bit of overview of a mathematical theory here. I mean, people who have used uh, the, the, the current, the, the framework with currents, um, but of course there's a huge amount in the engineering literature as well on this. And I think it's a very interesting area because it still has quite a lot of open problems. Okay, so I, I promised you a slide about uh, currents because I think it's maybe good at least to fix notations. I, I realize this is a geometric analysis seminar, so perhaps everybody um, is intimately familiar with this, but I thought it's still useful to uh, recall this briefly. So we start by looking at the space D top K of smooth, compactly supported K forms. And then we just mimic the, the classical construction of distributions as the dual objects to smooth functions and we dualize these K forms and what we get is the K currents. So that's the dual space to the smooth compactly supported K forms. This is of course, just like distributions are a very big space and contains all sorts of pathology, pathological objects. So it's very useful to actually immediately restrict uh, this to a subclass and the subclass we will we'll be dealing with are integral currents. So to, to, to define this, we first need to talk about integer multiplicity rectifiable currents. Okay, it's a bit of a mouthful, but it's effectively a measure of the following form. It's a measure of a multiplicity function uh, with values in the, the integers. Then there's an orienting map, which is um, a simple and unit length K vector at each point. And then you have the K dimensional Hausdorff measure on a K dimen on a countably HK rectifiable set. So um, what does this mean? It really means that you can think of it as a generalization of a K-dimensional manifold uh, with corners and boundary potentially. So I mean I've drawn this here and you see there's some sort of two surface here. Um, and at each point you orient the tangent space by giving um, yourself a K vector, two vector in this case. And uh, of course, you can also have a multiplicity, so you could count this twice. But it's an oriented manifold. Um, so it's a generalization of an oriented manifold. That's actually a good way of, of thinking about it. And then, um, so for, for this, you have a generalized area called the mass of this um, current. And it's just the, 
the integral of the multiplicity over this rectifiable set. If you, if you measure theoretically, right, you can also say it's the total variation measure of this current over the whole space. And as I promised you before, it, ha it has a very natural notion of boundary. And the nice thing about currents is that the boundary is defined by duality. So, um, he, so you can just define for any current, any K current, you can define a K minus one current boundary of T by duality. So DT against uh, paired with a K minus one from omega is just T paired with the exterior differential of omega. And so then of course, if this was a nice, um, uh, if, if this was a nice, um, Manifold, this would effectively just be Stokes, uh, the Stokes theorem. Um, and so you can see there's some sort of nice way it also associates an, uh, an, uh, an orientation with the boundary. And so this is all very nice because it's, uh, if you want an algebraic way of doing, going to a more general class of manifolds. And um, so the class we will be concerned with is the following. These are the integer multiplicity rectifiable K currents, such that the boundary is also integer multiplicity rectifiable, of course, K minus one current, and the mass of the current itself and the mass of the boundary are finite. In fact, I mean, this year is in fact automatic if you assume the mass bound by a boundary rectifiability theorem, but let's require it. And then finally, we might have a bounded support here. So the idea is really to have these nice geometric objects kind of put into, a, if you want, an analytical framework. And of course, one big advantage of this is that you can topologize these objects, you know, so you can think of convergence of manifolds in, in some ways, and we will in a minute. Okay, so having this at hand, let me tell you what really the goal is of, of this particular project. So um, I mentioned to you that uh, lots of people have studied dislocations modeled as one currents. However, what is not, not very much is known is um, to put an evolution on this one. And so if you want, this is, a, this is the, the defining goal of this project to understand and model evolutions of dislocation loops. So, I mean, schematically, you can think of it like this. You have this loop here, and then you want to kind of, it, it moves around in some way, and it ends up in this blue loop. Can, can and um, a quick so, question before you go further. So back in your motivating discussion, you had some loops whose holonomy, if you take the flat structure associated to the crystal, was non-trivial. That gave you the existence of a dislocation. Are your dislocations, if you will, Alexander dual to those loops? Because these are different loops. It's not the loop you drew that had three going one way and two the other. This is... Ah. Alexander, no, that's you're called, linking with it, right? Yeah, is that what, yeah that's okay. called the Burgers circuit. And mm -hmm. um, so there is a duality which can be written down precisely between the effectively these loops, which define a notion of torsion, if you want, and, um, and the loop, the, the dislocation loops, which are kind of going through those, those loops. So the so these Burgers loops are there to detect the presence of dislocations, but the dislocation itself is this blue arrow that I had in the middle. But there is no, certainly a duality. To make sure yes. it was clear to everybody, because I, I was trying to make sure I understood. Thanks. Yeah, so there definitely is. A, in fact, there is a very nice duality between the, if you want, you can think of these dislocations as an object dual to a torsion of another connection on the manifold. But I, I, I won't mention this here because uh, it leads a bit far away. And in fact, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's advantageous to think of the currents because then you can go to lower regularity. Whereas if you think of, of the, uh, the torsion, it's not so clear how to make low regularity uh, objects out of it. Okay, so, so um, right. So when, when you look at this, these evolutions, there's a few questions you should ask yourself. So first, which of those evolutions can actually be seen as some sort of deformation of a loop? This is a bit vague here, but I will hopefully uh, explain a bit more what I mean by this. Because in particular, what is allowed is that these dislocation loops, they shrink to a point. Yeah? And, and it's an oriented surface, so it kind of when it shrinks to a point, effect, it, just, it can disappear. It just cancels itself. And, um, and now, a really interesting point is that if you, um, if you look at the physics, it's a fairly... I guess, well-accepted fact 
that um, the uh, dissipation of going from one loop to another is roughly proportional to the area that your dislocation traverses, so the amount of area. So here I've tried to visualize this. So you have this area, this loop here, and you have the, tar the end loop here. And this shaded blue is the, um, is the area that has been uh, traversed. However, um, you need to count it with absolute multiplicity. So if you traverse something twice, then you have to actually uh, count it twice as well, because I mean, the dissipation is the cost, the energetic cost of moving this thing around in a crystal. Of course, that's not for free. And then, um, of course, you would like to define a velocity of this movement. Um, so we'll kind of give you a, a number if you want how fast it travels. And finally, because I want to ultimately do analysis with this, um, I need topologies on the convergence of such evolutions. And um, so I, I, the physical model is, is written down um, in a modeling paper by uh, Tom Hudson and myself, where we describe how you can formulate plasticity using this kind of model. And the key idea, which is, is really to, if you want, forget about the actual dislocations indexed by time for a moment and start from the two-dimensional object traced out by them. So it's a, what we call here a slip trajectory. So you, in this case, you start with a two integral current. So this is the surface traced out in the space-time cylinder zero T times omega bar. And um, <clears throat> so once you have this, this represents the whole evolution. And now you want to get back at this location at a particular time. So how do you do that? But the nice thing is that um, currents, integral currents, come with an operation called slicing. And the slicing is really, you can think of this as the intersection of this two-dimensional surface with a plane. And if you do that, you get a one-dimensional object, at least almost everywhere. Um, and in fact, uh, but this is a theorem for currents that you can for integral currents, you can slice them and almost for almost every T, you get a one current back. And then the only thing that remains to do is to push forward this current and kind of forget about the time coordinate because the slice still lives at time T. So here, let's say I'm doing the slice at time T and I'm pushing this forward back to the to uh, just the X coordinates. So here, ST is the slice of S with respect to the temporal projection, which gives me T and P star is the push forward under the spatial projection, uh, which forgets the time component. And this is all very nicely well defined now if you use um, if you use currents. Okay, and now I mentioned to you that I want these things to be loops. And um, so the, the one way to, to specify this is that the total boundary of this object S um, is, is, um, is zero. Um, in the open cylinder here. So it can only have something at the end points. And if you do that, you can prove that in fact, the slices will be boundaryless everywhere, almost everywhere. So that's that's kind of a nice way. So it, if you want the, the point of view changes a little bit from going from the, the dislocations first and then looking at the evolutions to looking at the evolution first and then getting the dislocations by slicing. And this turns out to give you effectively nice properties. And so this is the idea, which I will, um, hopefully explain a bit more. And so now I mentioned that um, I want to uh, measure the, the, the surface area traced out by the dislocation as it moves from, let's say, the black uh, loop to the blue loop. And um, here's the definition that you, you can use. Um, so you have this space-time integral current of dimension one plus K, which has this decomposition into the orient and multiplicity times Hausdorff measure. And you define the variation of this S as being the absolute value of the P of the orient um, integrated against uh, the total variation measure. And when I write P of this orient, I write the orienting map here is a K vector at each point. So I need to explain what I mean by this. And I, I mean this, I, it kind of defined, it's defined like this here where you, you, pull, you push the wedge product through. So this is sometimes called the push forward of the, the vector. And in fact, often in the literature, this is actually written as, as in this way. Yeah? But I don't do this because it, it just adds more symbols and I'm trying to keep the symbols down. Okay, and, and so if you do that, um, so this gives you really a measure of this, um, of this um, the, ar the area that's traversed. I want to show you another example. So here you have this loop and it first travels in that direction and then kind of goes back and at the same time deforms in some, some funky way. 
And if you compute the variation, it will be actually the, the, the area traced out, but counting absolute multiplicities. So for instance, here you go this way and then you go back. So you this area here, you need to count with multiplicity two. So this is counted twice. And then these lighter shaded ones are only counted once. Yeah. So it, it gives you kind of the right, the right measure of, of dissipation here. And it's a fairly nice definition. It's fairly, fairly short, but you can work with it a bit. And as I mentioned before, in in the dislocation theory, um, this dissipation. Yeah, question about um so you mentioned that you must count areas with multiplicity um yeah. does this take orientation into account if the the loop bends back on itself and it's traversed in the opposite and it traverses the area in the opposite direction it, it does but it does not cancel so you you if you go one way in this direction and then go back the other direction, it counts it twice because and that's what it should do. I mean, if the dislocation moves to the right by some units and then moves back to the left, the dissipation I'm getting is twice the, the distance traveled and not zero because I've just gone back on myself. So yeah, it does count. I mean, in a way, the, the absolute value bars you forget the actual orientation of the of the uh, I mean, you don't cancel when you go back on yourself. Okay, thank you. Okay, right. And then so the dislocate, as I mentioned in dislocation field, the dissipation is comparable to the variation. It's not exactly equal, but it's like um, one controls the other up to a constant. That's actually a theorem. And, and the next thing I want to mention is that in some ways um, you can estimate the mass of this, um, of uh, my trajectory s and the variation they estimate each other in an obvious way so the variation is obviously estimated by the mass and the mass is estimated by the variation plus an integral over the masses of the slices so it's like um, you can you can estimate them by each other so so being having bounded variation in this sense isn't anything different from having finite mass but it measures a different quantity. I think that's that's the, the key message I want to get across. So for instance, if I call something a variation, it should be invariant with, with respect to time rescalings, right? Because classical variations are, and this is true. So if you reparameterize, or if you have an injective Lipschitz map reparameterizing the time interval zero T, and you push forward this S under this, this reparameterization, the variation stays the same. Uh, because if you squeeze or compress time, it shouldn't change. I mean, it doesn't change the area I'm traversing. Um, and so, um, so the next thing I want to say that, I, okay, I call this the variation. I should probably give a bit more justification for that. And uh, so I want to, the next slide is that really this theory generalizes BV functions on a time interval, which you can think of as giving each point in time a Dirac mass or a point to things that give each point in time a higher dimensional object. So let's say a loop or a sheet. And in fact, the variation turns out to be the same as the classical variation, the zero dimensional case. So let me go through this briefly. So we have a BV map from zero one and we define as SU uh, to be that a one dimensional measure on the graph with the forward pointing unit tangent normal. This will be my S of U. And I, I need to of course say that, I mean, this is easy to define where the function has a value, but if it has a jump, what I need to do is I need to fill in the jump with its affine connection bit. Yeah. So let, this is what this, this means. If U, if T is a, is a jump point, then there's an additional parametrization going from from theta equal to zero at the bottom to theta equal to one. So I have to put the affine connecting bit in there. And then the variation defined in the previous slide is the same as the classical variation. So it's quite instructive, I think, maybe to, to show you why this is. So um, by a smoothing argument, we can first assume that U is actually C1. Um, otherwise, I mean, this replaces the jump by something that's almost uh, a jump, so that's fine. And then in this case, the variation for a BV function is just the absolute modulus of U dot integrated over the time interval. And uh, now I can use the area formula to rewrite this as an integral over the graph. This is 
fairly straightforward. And I get u dot divided by this area factor here, which is one plus modulus u dot squared. And um, now, of course, what is tau? Well, tau is one u dot divided by the modulus of one u dot. And um, if I now take p of this tau, I'm just deleting the one here. And, um, and then I take the absolute value bar of this, and then I get precisely uh, what I, uh, sorry, I get precisely, oops, wrong. I get precisely uh, actually what I have here, because the modulus of this is of course, square root of one plus modulus u dot squared. So, so in a way, I, I'm, what I want to convince you uh, is that, and then I, this is where I am here, and that's exactly how I define the variation. So, I mean, for the zero dimensional case, it's the same thing, but now we can think of evolutions, not of, of points moving about in time, but of loops and sheets, for instance. And uh, so the next thing I need to do is that I need to restrict the class a little bit further and look at things that are Lipschitz in time. So I want to, um, I want to uh, restrict this a little bit. And this is, this is quite important because I mentioned to you, I want to look at, if you want progressive in time deformations and they should have some regularity in time. And so what is the definition? The definition is we're taking a one plus K current on the space time cylinder and which has the property that the mass of the slices are uniformly bounded and also the mass of the boundaries are uniformly bound, uh, of the bound, the slices of the boundary are uniformly bounded. This doesn't really matter so much if everything is, if you impose this condition that you are, every slice is boundaryless, then you can ignore this. But, but in, in the general case, it's important. Then we don't have um, any mass at the endpoints, and the variation itself is a Lipschitz function. And the variation of the boundary is also a Lipschitz function. So if that's the case, then I call this a Lipschitz trajectory. And that's basically the class I want to, I want to use from now on. It's like, a, you can think of it as a continuous in time deformation. And if you have this, you can prove a couple of things fairly easily. So first of all, this thing doesn't have jumps. So what do I mean by a jump? Well, this would be here, my, my cylinder. And let's say then the cylinder just kind of jumps to another cylinder here. And this doesn't look very Lipschitz to me. Um, and this is also forbidden here. This is fairly easy to prove. Um, then the other point is that it has a good representative. So I mentioned that slices can only be defined almost everywhere, for almost every time. But for the Lipschitz trajectories, I can in fact define them for every time, basically by looking at a left and right limit. Um, you can always define left and right limits, but for Lipschitz trajectories, they agree. And so it's a un unique definition. And finally, there's some trace values here. So if you look at the boundary, oops, the boundary of S um, just at the end points, you get that at the end point, you have some sort of limit. If you come from the left, you get um, a trace. And if you come from the right at the beginning, you get another trace. So there is some sort of notion of where this comes from and where it goes. And um, OK, so let me uh, show you another kind of analogy of, of where the thinking came from to some degree. So we're talking at a homo, let's look at the homotopical deformation of space. So you start with a C1 homotopy uh, from omega to omega, which is the identity at the beginning and is some other function at the end, G of X. And I define the extended homotopy H bar um, by keeping the time component here. So it's T of H comma T of X. And um, so now give me, um, give me um, a current, a K current I'm starting with that is boundaryless. And I define um, the following surface. I take the canonical, um, the canonical current from zero to one. So this is just the, the, the one manifold from zero to one with the direction to the right and multiplicity one. And I take it as times T, and then I push forward under this extended homotopy. And I claim, and this is, you can prove, this is actually one of those Lipschitz deformations. And it has the property that it goes as expected from T, so delta naught times T is the initial trace, to G push forward of T. So it's kind of the deformation of T by G in the limit. 
And not only that, but the slices are also these kind of intermediate steps you get from the homotopy. And in fact, you can also prove that if the homotopy is essentially injective, which means that it doesn't do what was asked earlier, that you kind of go back on yourself and then you have a problem with cancellation, but you don't do that, then the variation is precisely the mass of the, the surface between the two endpoints of this evolution. And um, but, bef but let me say that <clears throat> even though you can start thinking about homotopies and trying to kind of generalize this, and this is really where these ideas came from, the problem with homotopies is that they represent a deformation of the space and not of a current inside living, inside of the space. And that really makes a difference. So you can think of situations of having um, a multiplicity two loop that splits up. And of course, you can't do that with a homotopy because each point has to be mapped to something. But you can do it with these trajectories where you split the loops and go into different directions. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to mention is this uh, concept of velocity, which you can now also define in a fairly straightforward way. So let's as assume again, we have one of those nice Lipschitz trajectories given here. And um, so it turns out that the orienting map of this S of this uh, trajectory actually splits as a wedge product of, of something. And what this something is, is a Xi, which I will define in a moment, and T vector. And T is the slice at time T. So, so um, if, you, if you think of dislocations, it's really the, the tangent vector to the dislocation to this blue loop at that time. And Xi, is the missing vector, which is the R, um, so the, it's the gradient of this time projection normalized with respect to the, um, the surface. It's a, it's, it doesn't really matter so much what the actual expression is. The point is that this is actually an orthogonal decomposition of the tangent space. So Xi and this T vector are always orthogonal to each other. And, um, and you also have a very nice Pythagorean identity, if you want, uh, where you can compute some lengths. And, and as a consequence of this, you have a very straightforward definition of what the velocity of this thing traveling is. And the velocity can just be defined as P of this vector Xi divided by the modulus of, um, of T of this Xi. Remember that P of T comma X was just X, and t of t comma x was t. So these are these projections. And so this you can define very easily. But let me point out that if you were to start with a time index families of currents, you could not do this because you can't easily define difference quotients and then pass to some limit. Yeah, I mean, it's not clear how to define a velocity of a time index family of currents. I, I wouldn't it's not, not clear to me. And also remember, they, this is really a normal velocity. So it's a velocity normal to the tangent of the loop. So it forgets about the, the loops don't rotate in themselves. They only move in a normal direction. So this is a fail. And if you go from the slip trajectory side, all of this is fairly straightforward to define. Okay. And so, um, okay. So hopefully I've given you a little bit of an kind of feel for what, what these objects are and what, why I, I introduced them in this way. And I want to show you a couple of theorems you can prove about them, which are useful for doing analysis for dislocations. So the first I want to show you is, is of course a deformation theorem. Everybody in working in geometric measure theory knows that uh, you need some sort of tools to, to work with uh, objects. And a very fundamental tool is the deformation theorem. And the idea is really you, you take a loop and you can deform it into um, a polyhedral chain. And a polyhedral chain is, um, is a current which has the property that it's a sum of K surface, K, sorry, of K faces of cubes of radius given, given sorry, of given, given side length. So the statement then reads, so you give me a, Given, given um, a k current, a k integral current t that is boundaryless for all rho, there exists such a slip trajectory which transforms t to p, 
So this is always my notation for transforming T to P because it's the boundary. And P is a polyhedral chain of, of um, size rho. And in addition to this, we have nice estimates. So you can see here, of course, if you choose your row small, then your approximation with this polyhedral chain gets better. And so you get that the variation of this S can be bounded by a constant, which is dimensional times rho times the mass of T. And so this works for everyone. And this is very useful. And you can do, I mean, it's, you can do a lot of things with that. In particular, you could, for instance, get a new version of the isoparametric inequality, which now uses the variation. Okay, and then the next um, couple of things I want to mention are, um, if you want the last uh, couple of things in this talk, are about looking at convergence of these uh, trajectories. Because, I mean, my goal is ultimately to describe um, evolutions of dislocations and plasticity. And to construct such solutions, of course, what can you do? You start some sort of iterative scheme and then you try to pass to a limit. So you need to understand in what sense can I pass to a limit of these objects. So uh, let me briefly recall that there is effectively, there's several notions of convergence for currents, but um, the most common are these. The weak star convergence, I mean, is remember currents are defined as dual objects to K forms. So you can just say it converges weakly star if the pairing between Tj and omega converges to T comma omega for all these K forms. And then another notion of convergence is the so-called flat convergence, which means that um, um, the, the global Whitney flat norm of the difference converges to zero. So what's this flat norm? Well, the flat norm decomposes a current T as a boundary and some remainder and then it takes the masses of these two bits. And then we take the infimum over all such decompositions. And uh, that's the Whitney flat norm. And the nice thing about these two notions of convergence is that if you have a uniform mass bound, so the masses of the Tj and the masses of the boundary of the Tj are uniformly bounded, then they are the same. Uh, so, so then in fact, um, weak star convergence is the same as flat convergence. Um, and in fact, we, under the uniform mass bound, we even have compactness, which is quite a deep theorem, actually, because, I mean, getting compactness is not hard, but the problem is you need to show that the limit is also an integral current. So, you know, if you, if you have a mass bound, you can find a subsequence such that Tj converges to T, which is an integral current or weakly star. Yeah. So this is just the, the recall here of, of these facts, but it's very useful for the, for the theory. And now I want to introduce a, a new notion of convergence, which is kind of adapted to this BV theory. And that's not surprisingly the following perhaps. So you take, um, we could define this BV weak star convergence of these trajectories is defined is weak star convergence in the sense of currents or flood convergence plus um, weak star convergence of almost all slices. So almost all slices have to converge to the limit. So if you want the operation of taking a slice and the operation of taking a limit commute. And so we have the compactness theorem, which tells you that if we have a uniform bound on the masses and uniform bound on the variations, then in fact, we can select a subsequence such that we get convergence weakly star in BV. And, um, as a corollary, we get that if these Lipschitz, if in fact we have Lipschitz uh, trajectories or Lipschitz deformations, yeah, in this sense, and the Lipschitz constants are uniform for, I mean, they're, remember the, the variation and the boundary variation were Lipschitz maps, so we need to require that those Lipschitz maps have uniform Lipschitz constants. Then, in fact, we get convergence, then the limit is also a Lipschitz trajectory, and we get convergence of all slices, not just of almost every slice, but of all slices. So this is kind of, kind of, if you want an analogy to the classical Helly selection principle for BV maps, and then um, some form of um, Azela Ascoli for uh, Lipschitz maps. And, um, and one thing, of course, now you can do with uh, having these Lipschitz maps is you can define another, yet another uh, convergence 
or another di distance between currents. And I want to, um, this is now becomes quite a natural object. So let's say you give me two current, K currents, T0, T1, that are boundaryless. So what's their distance? Well, I can measure, for instance, the distance with the Whitney flat norm, but I can also do the following. I can, I can just define the Lipschitz deformation distance as I take any Lipschitz deformation or Lipschitz trajectory going from T0 to T1, compute its variation, and then I take the infimum over all those trajectories. That's a nice way to think of, I mean, that's, if you want, that's a deformation, it's a distance adapted to this, this framework with variations. Okay, so now you can check. Excuse me, is this written in the language of Ambrosio Kirchheim or Federer Fleming current? I mean, yeah, they're just normal, they're just normal Federer Fleming currents. I mean, integral currents. There is okay, no metric, so, okay. there are no metric currents involved. I mean, you can make a connection, but um, it's not necessary. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. Okay, so so you can check a few things. Um, so the first is that that this is positive definite. That's something you can check fairly easily. You can check it's symmetric and you can check that it satisfies the triangle inequality, this new distance. But uh, let me mention that it's not necessarily finite, of course, if you have some hole, holes in omega bar that can, I wrote vaguely, that can be detected by boundaryless integral K currents, yeah? So of course this leads you to homology questions or homotopy, depends a bit on how you think of this. Um, and I don't want to go into this here. Um, it's not ultimately important for us. If you want, you can forget about this and think of omega being simply connected. Uh, but let's not, I don't want to go into too much detail here. But of course, now again, you get yet another convergence of, of boundaryless integral currents. Namely, you can just say they converge to each other if this new deformation distance goes to zero. It's also very natural if you want, if you come from this side. And uh, so one of the theorems in this paper is that this is the same as weak star convergence. So going to, to zero in the, in the deformation distance is the same as converging weakly star. But let me um, give you a corollary. And the corollary is that, in fact, you get something very different here. So um, you, in addition, remember that this, the, the Lipschitz distance is defined as the infimum over all these connecting trajectories. So um, going from Tj to T in this case. So what you get is, for, at least for a subsequence of the Js, you actually get a, a trajectory connecting Tj to T with vanishing variation in the limit. So it's not just that you get abstractly that this is the same, but you get a, like a, a witness for the fact that Tj converges to T, which is a deformation of Tj into T. So it's not just saying they are close in some abstract sense. I actually have a deformation deforming one to the other. And in fact, the deformation also has uniformly bounded slice, uh, slice masses. And this is a dimensional constant here. And this is actually the key result I need in the analysis of proving some existence theorem for dislocation motion, because it, um, uh, because you need to kind of translate some convergence into um, a varying, into a vanishing variation slip trajectory between Tj and its limit T. This is this is somehow the crucial corollary. So if you want, you everything leads up to the fact that if Tj converges weakly start to T, then you can actually deform Tj into T in this very specific sense. Um, yeah, so I've written this down here. Right, I'm supposed to not overrun. So um, I'm going to talk very briefly um, about uh, something else. And then I will, I will um, just have one last slide about this. I think 50 minutes was what I was supposed to, to, to talk, right? Okay, yes, so that's my work. Okay. Okay, so, um, so there's also another notion, which I I like to call the boundaryless Whitney flat norm. I don't know if anyone has a better version. So if T is already boundaryless, then in fact, you can define, you can then, if the homology of omega bar is nice, you can, let's say it's, it's the whole space to not get too complicated here. Then you can write, um, write T actually as a boundary itself. 
And, and then you can take the mass of this Q whose boundary is T and take the infimum over all of those Q and you get uh, another measure of the size of T if you want. And so if you want, if T is actually the blue line and the black line, uh, then this F naught of this would be the, the, the surface in, in between here. And so now what, what I can show is that in fact, all these convergences of currents are the same. Convergence in distance, in the Lipschitz distance, weak star convergence, flat convergence, and convergence of respect to the boundary less flat distance. So that's, that's nice. And um, let me, uh, the last theorem I wanted to, to show you is um, what I call the equality theorem. And in fact, it states that the distance between T0 and T1 measured in this Lipschitz deformation distance is exactly equal to the flat, uh, to the boundaryless Whitney flat norm. And whatever, um, I mean, there's a physical reason for wanting this, this theorem. Um, and that's that you can, there's a nice physical interpretation of this. So up, we have actually two ways to measure the dissipation, and it's not so clear from the physics of which one is the right one. You could re, you could use this boundaryless Whitney flat norm, and that's done, for instance, in a recent work by Scala and Van Gotham, or you could use the variation or some modification of it, which would be a dissipation. Yeah, I mean these are both they both seem a priori valid ways of measuring this dissipation, but this, this theorem tells you they're actually the same. Yeah, so you get the same value. But the point is that if you lose the, the Lipschitz distance here, you actually get a connection. I mean, you, you get something that is almost minimizing and it connects T0 with T1. So it's not like you have some abstract distance between them. So for instance, if you just look at F0 omega bar, well, this is this, this shaded area, but I don't know how to deform the black loop into the, the blue loop. I, I can't tell from this one. Whereas, of course, if I have a very, if, if it's the variation of a deformation trajectory, like here, I actually have a time indexed movement. And if you do plasticity, you need the time indexed movement of one dislocation to another because along this dislocation movement, the plastic, uh, I mean, the, the material deforms in some sort of flow. And for that, you need the time index. So, you, so it's, it's important to start to have this variation framework. And so, yeah, okay, I don't want to talk about the proof much because I don't really have time. So the only thing I want to say is that one direction is, is basically trivial and the other direction needs some fairly recent, I mean, very recent approximation theorems for, for, um, for currents, the polyhedral chain by uh, Colombo, De Rosa, Marquez and Stuvert. And then there's an improvement by Chambol, Ferrari and Melley, actually this year, appeared this year. So um, that's nice. Okay, and then, so the last slide is the outlook. Um, I, I just wanted to maybe loop back a little bit, um, no pun intended here, to the dislocation loops. Um, and so what you can do if you, if you develop this theory, you can make this model of, of Tom Hudson and myself rigorous, and you can actually um, uh, kind of define the objects in, it in a precise mathematical way. And you can also do, what you can also do is prove an existence theorem of, of plastic deformation which is driven by the movement of dislocations. And so I just want to say two words about that. So you have a total energy functional, which is some sort of potential energy if you want. And it depends on a deformation Y, which is this global changing of the shape and some internal variables. And there are plastic distortion and the dislocations themselves. And the dissipation is some functional, which you can think of as being roughly the same as the variation. And then, so how do you construct a solution? Well, you, you do a, what's often called a time incremental minimization problem. So you discretize the time in an equidistant grid. And then in each time step, you minimize something of the form. It's the energy functional plus the dissipation. And, and so what you do is you define the, the evolution of where you are in the internal variables at step k minus one by this slip surface and by the slip trajectory. And, and so this, you can only do if you have this time index I've alluded to for the last 50 minutes, almost 49 minutes. So um, it's really important to have these continuous in time or progressive in time deformations and not just kind of a difference between yeah, as, a, as a surface. 
So maybe a, a geometrist, of course, do know this. So it is, you could call this a minimizing movement scheme. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a bit more complex because there's plasticity as well. But for instance, if you were to construct Bracky flow, one way to do this is you can do this by using uh, time incremental minimization problems. And then, of course, you pass to the limit and you get some solution. And uh, that's really the content of this, this other paper. So, um, yes, that's it. Thank you very much. And you can find the preprints all on the archive as of now.